Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Ask Dr. David. We have been getting a lot of questions lately about COVID immunity, um, what's happening, are people's antibodies waning, did I have immunity because I had COVID, so many questions. So we decided we would do a more extended version of our Ask Dr. David series, and we will be addressing today COVID immunity. Hi, David. Hello. Hi, everybody. So we're going to dive right in. And the first thing that I want to talk about is just helping people understand, myself included, um, immunity and sort of the body's various levels of defenses in fighting off infection. Yeah. So we our immune systems are very complex from the antibodies that are passed along to newborn babies through their mother to the umbilical cord, which lasts for short periods of time on the order of months, to what is referred to as the innate immune system. This is a general immune system that's not specific to a particular virus or bacteria, but more in order to identify things that are foreign or foreign infected cells that our body can create things like macrophages in order to then get rid of those cells and destroy them. So let me and ask then, you a quick question there. So those are just general immune defenses that every body has, every healthy body, if they're not immunocompromised, to fight off the infections and various things that we encounter on a daily basis? Yes, and those are much stronger when we are our youngest, and that's probably the reason why kids have been having such a, especially young kids, have been so less impacted by, coronav by coronavirus than older people. Okay, and now let's talk then specifically about what happens when somebody comes into contact with a specific virus, such as, um, you know, such as SARS-CoV-2. Yes, so we have what are called B cell and T cells. So T cells are, do, there's two types. There are what are called natural killer cells or suppressor types of cells that identify the, our cells that are infected. And then they go ahead and they destroy those and the virus along with it. And then there are also other kind of what are called helper T cells, which then go on to stimulate B cells to create plasma cells, which are what makes the antibodies that um, are also not just fighting off the infection, but then part of what gives us our long-term immunity. Okay, great. So it sounds like from the layman's perspective, as I understand it, that the immune system is, as we would expect, very complex, um, that there are these innate things that we have for every day. And then there are sort of virus specific, which really come about um, when, when we're trying to fight off um, particular types of things invading our body. Um, okay, so let's leave it at that without getting too scientific on it. And what I want to know now is Obviously, innate immunity is something we technically all have if we're, if we're healthy. Um, how does one develop these T cells, B cells, antibodies um, for something specific like the coronavirus? So they are particular to specific proteins. So in the case of the virus, the spike protein is a, is a very big target. There are also other proteins on the virus itself, and the body is able to recognize them as foreign. They then create at first what's called IgM antibodies. Those are amongst the first responders. There are also IgA antibodies that more hang out in the longer term on our respiratory tracts, nasal passages, intestinal passages, et cetera. Um, et, et cetera. But then also once the, the, these IgM cells, which are the first responders, then turn over to IgG and then IgG are, antibodies are made. And that's what continues the fight they're typically more showing up a couple of weeks into the infection. And those are the antibodies that stick around for longer term infection uh, protection. Now, in the case of a, pe a person who chooses to get vaccinated, um, as people may know, what is being introduced to the body is messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is just like messenger RNA that we all have in our bodies every day, make proteins from reading the messenger RNA. And in the case of the coronavirus vaccine, makes the spike protein. The spike protein is then put onto the cell's um, surface, predominantly the muscle cells, because it's injected into people's arms. And there, it then flags the same way that a virally infected cell that has the messenger that has a spike protein, it then flags it and then creates an immune response against that spike protein, which then goes on to have memory so that if we see that spike protein again, whether it was for, because we took the vaccine or whether a person was uh, had the infection, then our body has that memory after that. Okay, so I want to back up because you just said a lot there. So one of the things that I think 
myself and others are trying to understand here is in reference to like the question, the big question, do I have immunity from COVID has to do with, um, you know, it seems like there's two ways that you would have developed these. One is through having sort of a, a more natural immunity and in, in, because you were infected with the what we call a wild virus out in the community. Um, and if you had that, then you either were asymptomatic or symptomatic um, or you received the vaccine. Um, so those are sort of the ways that, that you would develop these antibodies. Is that is that basically right? Okay, so is there, you know, like what are the differences or the main differences for people to take away, if any, between um, the type of immune response that you would develop, let's say if you had a symptomatic response versus an asymptomatic response, if you had the infection, like let's take vaccines out for a second and just talk about the infection. Is the immune response going to be the same regardless of whether you are asymptomatic or symptomatic? The research so far is showing that a person who had a symptom, who had symptomatic not asymptomatic, if they had symptoms, that it does appear as if the antibody response in the memory is, is greater than somebody who had um, an asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic condition. And that to me makes sense, right? Because the body had to be actually fighting something that was making the person sick. Okay. Right. So and there's then... more of it when your person has rapidly dividing and growing virus that's continuing to make more and more and more spike protein over all of those days when a person's sick. So the, the more spike protein that the body's being presented, then the more antibodies then the, is needed in order to fight them back. Okay. And so if somebody had the, uh, a, a, uh, if somebody was symptomatic with the, with the natural virus, and then you compare that to somebody who did never had COVID, but they got, you know, full, fully vaccinated, um, what does that look like in terms of does one of those people potentially, I know the data is still kind of coming in on this, but have more immunity or a broader immunity potentially against COVID or various coronaviruses in general? Yeah, so when a person gets a natural infection, there's many other proteins on the surface of that virus, in this case, the spike than the spike protein. So the other proteins that the, that the body can then recognize as foreign to help fight off is going to be there when a person has a virus and is exposed to that as opposed to the vaccine, which is only presenting the spike protein itself. So one of the antibodies that we are able to identify on the lab tests are called nucleocapsid antibodies. These will only show present in the from somebody who had the wild disease, not somebody who's been vaccinated. So that is another antibody that's there that's going to help the body recognize this foreign substance to help coat it and get rid of it. And my understanding from conversations you and I have had is that if you have that particular type of neoclasped uh, um, nucleocapsid. Nucleocapsid antibody. Um, it doesn't necessarily tell you much other than that at some point you were infected with this and you still have these lingering antibodies. It doesn't necessarily tell you when you were infected or whether you were symptomatic or asymptomatic. It just tells you that you do have these wild virus antibodies still circulating in your body. We just don't necessarily know what that means, right? It just says you had the virus. Right. And we don't, and that's also not a, a quantitative number and not a number itself. It just shows present or not present. So we also don't know how robust that antibody is. So we don't know does that person has it. I mean, what could one logically think that if a person who has those antibodies um, and who had the virus would be potentially more protected than somebody who doesn't just because it's another target, but we don't know that for sure, sure. nor do we know how strong that protection is relative to the spike protein antibodies. Okay, so then let's talk about that because you had mentioned sort of a binary yes or no test when it comes to that. But I know that that things have progressed now and there is something called a semi-quantitative test in which you can actually test somebody's antibodies and it gives you a number. So talk about these numbers, what they mean. I know people are starting to ask about getting tested, but we don't necessarily know what the numbers mean in like a hard, in a hard way. We haven't been told like what number makes you protective. Right. So this is a specific number that is measured in the blood that's looking for antibodies against the spike protein, neutralizing antibodies, et cetera. So these are antibodies that have been correlated that it does seem as if the higher the level of these antibodies are, the more protected that a person is, the less likely that they are going to catch COVID or be able to have or to be a more severe case. So when I first started checking them, um, I had um, some a couple of people who had wanted to check their antibody levels after one dose of a Pfizer vaccine just to see did they develop antibodies. And the test reports as positive, not protective, but positive is greater than 0.08. 
And these two people came in around 30, which at the time, so this was probably about like April, May-ish. That sounded pretty good at the time to me. If, protect, if positive is 0.8 and these are 30s, that's like 30 times more protective. Um, as many people know, I did choose to be vaccinated back in January, February. Um, when I did my antibody levels in May, June, um, it came back at over a thousand, pardon me, at a thousand, thousand and five, um, which then made me think, oh, those other people's levels in the 30s didn't sound so good anymore because again, the more soldiers we have to fight this off, then the better. I then repeated my antibody levels uh, about two months later and they had dropped 15%. 850 was still a very robust number compared to most of the other tests that I saw, but that's a pretty significant drop for a period of time. This was around the time that, that Delta was also really starting to spike. We knew that Delta was having different types of breakthrough than the previous. I did very well with the first couple doses of the vaccine. And so I did choose to get boosted. So that I then checked my antibodies approximately three weeks after that. And my antibody levels for the semi-quantitative was greater than 2,500, which is the highest reported limit. So I may be much higher than that. I don't know. I'll continue to follow them. But I also figured, hey, 2,500 is greater than 1,000 is greater than 30. And so that kind of gave me a, a, a more sense of, what, wow, I really do have some very robust immunity. Now, I've seen levels in the couple hundreds, in the teens, in the, in the um, single digits. And so, again, we don't know maybe above 50 or maybe 100, 200, 500 is protective. And hopefully we will know that information as the research is being done. I'm really just taking an approach of that more has to be better, even though we don't know for sure what level is fully, fully protective. Okay, so a couple things that I, I wanna mention just for those of you that know, I'm also Dr. David's sister, so I'm privy to some information that the rest of the public may not know. Um, so um, David did decide to get the booster um, in part because of his own health history um, and conditions and because of the fact that as a healthcare provider and a physician, he is in contact on a regular basis with people that are potentially uh, COVID positive. Um, and so one of the things that we have an entire episode that David did and asked Dr. David about, about boosters. And, um, and we'll probably do an, another one of those coming up soon because like with everything with COVID, we're kind of learning more as the information comes in regarding boosters. So let me um, move off. One thing I also wanted to say about that is that there's this term that's floating around called super immunity. Um, when I first heard about it, I was very excited. I thought maybe I had a cape or something that was going to be showing up in the mail for me. Um, and what, what this was, and maybe you could talk about this, was for somebody who had um, experienced a symptomatic version of, of COVID, which I did back in November of 2020. Um, I had like a moderate level of, of infection um, in terms of my illness. Um, and then I did choose to get vaccinated about seven months later. Um, and so when I heard about the super immunity is that people who had the wild virus also may be showing protection against coronavirus variations that existed 20 years ago. Right, or in that they're predicting that also may have immunity to additional coronaviruses that may be coming down the peak in the years to come, right? Because these are regularly occurring. So, is there anything you want to say about super immunity other than I'm not getting a cape? Yeah, your cape has been rescinded. Sorry about that. Um, so basically, in a way, you could think of it as a booster, it's as, a, as a minimum. So whether a person had the vaccine first and then had a, a breakthrough infection, of which we know those are overwhelmingly mild for people, but then that's almost like that, that catching COVID was almost a booster to, you know, in terms of their antibodies and also vice versa, people who had had the disease. And since we know that over time, the antibody levels are dropping, we know that four or five, six months um, longer that eventually these numbers do fade for people. So if a person also had the vaccine earlier and then got, and then got, a, got another, got the vaccine, then they kind of got boosted there as well. The information is showing that one dose of a vaccine is um, after COVID is actually showing tremendous protection and that it's not nearly the same jump of infection with a second dose. Of course, there's a societal aspect of being fully vaccinated, which doesn't take into account at all a person's antibody levels or their past um, virus exposure slash symptoms, et cetera. See, we know that fully vaccinated just means according to um, being fully done with that series of two for the messenger RNAs or one for the Johnson & Johnson. But one dose of a vaccine is a tremendous booster to somebody who had the who had the virus months ago, you know, half a year ago, year ago. Even right, more. because it basically serves as as that booster or that second shot. Okay, right. so you you said um, something regarding waning immunity, and I think it's something important that we that we address here. 
Um, I know that people are asking questions like, well, I had the virus or I decided to get vaccinated or both. Um, why do I have to keep wearing a mask? Why do I have to, you know, why am I not allowed to just travel freely? And people are asking me to show, you know, various levels of documentation. I know that this is a very big issue and we will continue that conversation um, at another time. But what I want to ask you now is the public health approach to people wearing masks, continuing to physical distance and take some of the same precautions. Talk about why that is being asked, even for people that are vaccinated or already had um, COVID. Is that because the vaccines don't work? Like that's that's one of the things. No, the vac well, the, well, the vaccines, as well as natural immunity, does work. It's preventing people from getting really sick. You know, let's face it, if all we were getting was a cold or mild flu symptoms from this, and it wasn't causing all the long haulers, it wasn't causing the heart and lung inflammation, if it wasn't causing people to go on heart lung machines and unfortunately pass away, we wouldn't be in this mess right now. We wouldn't be doing all of these things. But this is a much more fatal and morbid um, condition. So what do we know? That people can get breakthrough infections from the infections from the vaccine. We know that people can get a recurring or a recurrent, a second infection if they have the virus. We know that one of the things that's different about Delta, which is what we're doing dealing with right now, is that the viral load, the amount of viral particles, even if a person is asymptomatic, relative to a person who's asymptomatic from the virus or asymptomatic because they um, from the vaccine, but they are a carrier, the viral load is high. And so of course, the more virus, viral particles that are in our throat, in our nasal passages, the more we can put out into the environment. And it doesn't just have to be from coughing or sneezing, just the sheer act of, of singing or talking right in front of somebody face to face or yelling at a sporting event, especially if it's indoors. So those things are still being passed out into the environment. And of course, we know how well the circulation and the air is, the ventilation, how open things are, windows. That also plays a very important part in terms of lowering the viral load in the vicinity. But those are still there. So you know, as we start to see the virus, which thankfully we're seeing it coming down, and as we're seeing the percent positivity tests going down and the number of cases going down, I anticipate that we will get to a point where which it's deemed that, okay, that level of additional protection is not there. But the most important thing is you think of it as layers of protection, okay? People have an alarm on their house, but they also lock their doors. Some people have um, other forms of security that, that they do, you know, living in a gated community or whatever, you know, obviously some of these go to pretty big, um, to, to much le levels of protection. But let's face it, every layer of protection that we have is just that, another layer of protection stopping something bad from happening. Right. Well, and it's interesting, that's an interesting analogy that you said, because um, I've lived in places where um, where I didn't have to lock my doors, right? Or have an alarm system because it, I like lived very far out and I wasn't around anybody, right? Whereas when I lived sometimes in a, in a deep, you know, deep part of a city, I maybe had those other things. And so I think that's also part of the consideration too. It has to do with what are you exposed to? Like, what is the threat level that you're exposed to in terms of these levels of protection that you're gonna take? There is, I know we're gonna have to wrap up in a minute, but I did just wanna to touch on one other thing you said, and it had to do with, um, with uh, asymptomatic spreading. So you said that it is still possible that somebody who's asymptomatic uh, carrier of the virus can spread, but presumably they don't spread as much as somebody who is symptomatic, um, assuming that they're not like yelling and screaming in people's faces, because when somebody is symptomatic, one of the main symptoms of a respiratory infection is coughing and sneezing, which then puts a lot of the viral load into the environment and makes it more contagious for the people around them. But one of the things I wanted to ask you to clarify is you had said um, people who are asymptomatic after having the vaccine. And I just wanted to get clarity on that before, because if somebody gets the vaccine, they're not actually getting the virus so, running through their body. Yeah, I, yeah, let me clarify that. So people who were vaccinated who later were exposed to the virus and are asymptomatic from that viral infection, not okay. because they're asymptomatic because the, the vaccine are now have that they don't they don't have the virus from the vaccine. There's no that's, viral particles. That's what in I wanted to clarify. Right. right. And then also I want to confirm too that the data, at least as we currently have it, is that um people who did get the vaccine um taking away their prior exposure to COVID, whether they had it or not, that one of the things the vaccine is allegedly doing, it's reducing the likelihood that you will 
catch COVID one, but then if you do catch COVID, it's reducing the likelihood that you will be symptomatic. So you could be walking around vaccinated and having COVID and have some level of ability to spread that to other people. But if you're asymptomatic, regardless, you'll be spreading that less than if you were symptomatic. Right. And in addition to the more serious conditions, because one of the things we also do know is that the data right now is showing that people who catch COVID who are unvaccinated are showing 10 times more likely of being hospitalized than if somebody was vaccinated and it's a breakthrough and are 11 times more likely to be fatal. So those are important numbers that I think that whenever people are considering and weighing their options, that those are really important factors to take into account. Right. And I know that you do a lot of work with people. Um, Dr. David's approach is, is for everything, uh, individualized medicine. And what that basically means is that there is no one size fits all. Everybody needs to look at their own individual circumstances, their family circumstances, their economics, what their support system is like, what their immune system is like, their health history, and all of these things need to be put into an individualized calculation that outweighs the benefits versus the risks for the individual as to whether or not they take any medical intervention regarding anything. Um, we also have a show that we'll be doing coming up where we'll be talking about the public health aspect of this, the public health policy of some of the things that are going on right now regarding vaccine management mandates or requiring masks in certain locations. And that is a whole other back of box that we'll be unpacking on another episode. But for now, we're going to go ahead and wrap up this episode. We hope that you learned some things about immunity. Um, we probably left you with more questions than you came in with, possibly because we introduced some new concepts. But we do want your questions. So please do look below to the comments section. Give us your feedback. Also ask us questions that you still want Dr. David to answer. Please do subscribe to this channel and find us on all of our social media outlets. And Dr. David, thank you so much for another great episode. Absolutely. Have a great day, everybody. Take care now. Bye-bye.